Hi folks. Today I want to introduce you to the Heathkit Electronic Design Experimenter, uh, the model ET3100. Now these are fantastic ways to uh, build up your lab uh, very economically. If you look at this thing here, you know, it's got a, a power supply, a line frequency section, which can also be used as an AC power supply, as long as you're not drawing any more than 200 milliamps. And a function generator over here that pr provides sinusoidal and square waves all the way from approximately uh, 2 kilohertz or 200 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. And you also get this uh, breadboard and two potentiometers, a 1K and a 100K. And these can be had on eBay for very, very little. Um, I just looked recently and, and I've seen them for as little as 30 bucks. Uh, I think I picked this one up. Um, it had some problems. It was uh, sold for parts only. I think I picked it up for about $20 or something like that. And what it needed was a Zener diode that was gone bad in one of the power supplies. And there's a little light bulb inside the oscillator that is required. Uh, for the oscillator to work properly and, and, and that was gone. So I had to replace the little light bulb. I mean, all the Heathkit manuals, original manuals are available. And you can, you know, the sections like tests and adjustments, uh, troubleshooting chart, and you know, the specifications, all of this is, is, they're all available online. So you pick up one of these things and it has problems, then really all you have to do is, is, is go through these procedures that are all outlined in the documentation to find out what's wrong with it and fix it. And there are full schematics available too. So you can dive right into the thing, find out exactly what's wrong with it. Now they're not complicated. They're not terribly complicated at all. But they do provide, you know, two power supplies, a function generator, and some potentiometers, and a, and a breadboard all in one device. Outside my lab here, in another location, I have an office. And there I have a USB oscilloscope, a multimeter, and some small tools. and these i have this and another one which i'll probably show you in another video i keep them there just so i have an idea or something like that i'll bring some components with me while i'm have to be in the office and i'll tool around in my spare time and set something up on them and see you know get some sort of proof of concept of what i was thinking about and they're perfect for that sort of thing it's like a mini lab uh, all, all there just in the one device but uh as you probably noticed i have this one mostly taken apart um, this is the little breadboard here. Now the one thing that can be difficult to deal with, with with these is that the breadboards can sometimes be, you know, the contacts in them can be fairly corroded. Now what I tend to do with them, like these, this one was okay, but the other one I have had some corrosion. What I tend to do is like if I stick a part in there, it doesn't quite work right. Well, I'll stick a little deoxid in there, just a drop, and then I work the component in it. And eventually by the time I do that enough times, the board is, uh, is okay. But I'll show you another solution to that uh, coming up. But for now, let's just take the top off this thing. And you can see the main circuitry here up at the top. It's all very nicely laid out. It's all very easy to get to, it's spread apart. So if you do have to work on it, it's really easy to work on. That's the little light bulb I had to replace. Well, let me show you, kind of go through what's, what's here. So here's all the signal generators, like from here over. This is the operation amplifier. It's a venerable old 741. And it's in a Wienbridge oscillator configuration. I had heard somewhere that uh, Bill Hewlett of Hewlett Packard was one of the first people to actually use a little light bulb in the negative feedback circuit of the Wienbridge oscillator. As the voltage across it increases as the wave is being produced, its impedance will increase as it warms up. And because this is in the negative feedback loop, it'll tend to decrease the amplitude of the, the output of the oscillator, therefore improving its distortion. It produces a very, very nice sine wave, which then comes out and goes into this class AB amplifier here. And that comes out as the sine wave. And then it goes through this wave squaring circuit. It gives you a nice square wave. And then down here you have the power supply. So it comes in through a transformer. It's a nice linear power supply. None of that uh, switching rubbish. And uh, you'll notice here that these two sides here are identical. So it was the positive one here, this diode here I had to replace. But um, they're identical except for where the one uses MTNs, the other one uses PMPs. But other than that, they're 
they're identical circuits, the diodes are reversed around. They produce very good uh, stable output. They're nice little designs. They don't use any integrated circuits, they're all in, in here. The only integrated circuit used at all is this uh, 741. But everything else is nice discrete components. And you can learn quite a bit just from looking at these schematics about electronics. Now let me take off the, the other final two screws. I'll show you what it's like on the other side. This one wasn't particularly beautifully put together. And that's another thing you could do too if you really wanted to improve them. You could get into them and kind of rebuild them. Like all these parts are still available. So this is kind of what it looks like underneath. It's not atrocious, but uh, some of the stuff like these long leads and uh, you know the, just the placement of the components and pots being a little bit twisted and stuff. It, it just the attention to detail wasn't that wonderful, and no. Um, attempt was made to clean the flux off the board and there's the power supply down there the transformer and that's just about it yeah we could run through the specifications just a little bit here so the power supply will produce from uh, 1.2 to 15 volts either negative or positive load regulation is better than one percent current output is 100 milliamps on either side this section here the 60 hertz sine wave output. So you've got uh, 15 volts AC on both sides or 30 volts AC if you take them both together. And you can draw a maximum of 200 milliamps from those. Yeah, the oscillator here is the 74 goes from 200 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And it's got two ranges. The low range is 200, 2 kilohertz, and then the high range is 2 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz. And the output is 1 volt RMS from 600 ohms uh, with less than 4% distortion. And the square wave output is 15 volts peak to peak, so it's not adjustable as, as to the amplitude, but you do have two potentiometers here. And you could take either one of these outputs, put them through the potentiometers, and then get a variable output if you wanted to. Go back to the square wave output and a rise time of one microsecond, a duty cycle of 30%. Good enough for a lot of things. Okay, so now with the breadboards. Now, if you did want to replace the breadboards, there's a number of things you could do. Let me pop these two screws back in here. Now, if you didn't like the, the condition of the bedboard that comes with it, there, there's a number of things you could do. Now you can, these little ones here, these little stick on, they just stick right on, you peel them back off and they stick on. You can put a number of those in. In fact, you could put six of them in here, no problem at all. Now you'd, you'd vastly increase the number of positions that you have over what's here. Or uh, another thing I was thinking of too is a, you know, a board like this. Although be careful with these boards here. Like these little boards here, the, the ones I've always gotten have been good. I just, I guess I've been lucky. I haven't found any really bad ones yet. But these ones here, this one in particular, is, is just a piece of crap. So you've got to be careful <clears throat> about picking these things up. Uh, this particular style of board was made very popular by the Arduino crowd. But there are good ones and there are bad ones. It's true of anything that gets really, really popular. You get a lot of fakes come out. But then you could put it on like this. So you could stick on whatever you wanted as far as boards are concerned. You don't have to go with what com it comes with if it's in bad shape. Okay, here I got it all back together again. And I'm just going to keep this socket here because it's good. It's in good shape. I may at some later date, if it starts to get worse, replace it like I showed before. But uh, yeah, let's have a look at, um, at some of these uh, functions that it can do. So we can see here we have on, on the meter here, we have the positive power supply. And the specification said it would go from 1.2 to 15. So we're down here 1.25, that's the lowest it'll go. And it'll give you up to 15.8 volts. So the markings on it are right on 10 there, 10.5, right on 5 there, 4.79. It's close enough. I wouldn't use it without a meter to test the voltage first, but I mean, you could. I don't think you would end up damaging anything. You're not going to be that far off. Let's see the negative supply. 
So it's set right in the middle there, what you expect to be seven and a half. So this one's a little bit more out. Is that 10? What do we get? 10.6. This one's off by a little bit more. So that five. 5.38. What's the maximum? Minus 15.9. It's basically minus 16 volts. And what's the minimum? Minus 1.203. I don't know if there is any adjustment that can be done. So you'd uh, you'd literally have to play around with some of the components to get the calibrated supply voltages. But I wouldn't bother. I would just use your meter to check your voltage before you connected up your circuit. Yeah. Well, let's have a look over here at the AC source. Be perfect for building your own uh, power supplies. So let's go over to AC on the meter. So 16.9 volts. They claim 15, but this is unloaded. Remember that'll go down with a reasonable load on it. And up here it should be exactly the same. It's coming off a transformer. 16.9. And then between them, we should get nearly, nearly 34 volts. But as, as I say, that's without a load. As you load that down, that's going to, the voltage is going to come down a little bit. Okay. Let's put this over to ohms. And we'll check out these potentiometers. Let's go from the, the wiper to one of the legs. First, uh, so it's supposed to be one kilo ohm. There we are, 1.19 kilo ohms. Uh, the lowest reading here I can get is four ohms. And over here, the 10 k ohm pot. Okay, lowest resistance is 21 point. Well, let's call it 22 ohms. So 94 K ohms is the maximum. Everything's testing out pretty good. And let's have a look at that function generator there. So we're on the square wave. We're at the low range and on the minimum frequency. And um, see if I can bring up the measurements. There we go. So what's it giving us as far as frequency is concerned? 150. 160 Hertz So if we go up to halfway It's supposed to be like about one kilohertz there and So 1.28 kilohertz you go up to the maximum There's supposed to be two kilohertz right here And it's reading at 3.5 kilohertz so the the knob is not very well calibrated, but again, I wouldn't bother if I wanted a, an accurate frequency, I would use my oscilloscope or frequency counter to determine exactly what the frequency was before I committed to uh, doing any real measurements or experimentation with it. So let's see if it's a little bit better on the high range. Bring it down here. So the high range starts off at a low of about 12.5 kilohertz. That can't be right, is it? I will adjust this properly. It is. Okay, we're going to have to look into this a little bit. So starting off at 12.5 kilohertz here. It's supposed to be two in that range. So halfway up, when it's supposed to be 10 kilohertz, it's reading 40 kilohertz. And right up at the top, that's, that's way beyond, that's way beyond, beyond what it's supposed to be doing. So that, that squaring circuit is not being able to, you know, a squaring circuit is supposed to work up to around there. and It's still keeping the wave kind of square. This is going way beyond that frequency. So, of course, as it gets up there, it can't maintain a square wave. But it's maintaining a, a decent uh, voltage output. Yeah, but we, we can get up uh, to 55 kilohertz, so we're going way beyond the 20 kilohertz that is specified. So maybe the, I need to look in at the uh, generator a little bit more here and see what I can do with fixing it up a bit. More fun with electronics. All right, so let's now look how it, 
the sine wave output. Of course, the frequencies are not going to change because the square wave frequencies are derived from the sine frequencies. So, so yeah, roughly the same frequencies. 55 kilohertz. It's actually still a pretty decent sine wave at that frequency. As we come down, get down to the 20 kilohertz range where it's supposed to be working. That's pretty nice looking. I mean, I don't have a distortion analyzer to let me know if it's if it's bad or good, but it looks good. And then down in the low range. You could turn up the frequency this way, you could turn it down that way. But as far as being able to read the frequency off it, that's no good. Well, that's it. So that's the, the, the rundown of the model ET3100 electronic design experimenter from Heathkit. And I think these are a fantastic little inexpensive addition. I use it all the time, especially this one. I also have the ET3200, which I might do a video on as well. It's more for digital work, but it's also just as cool, just as nice as this. And I got that one also again with problems. I, I bought it with uh, needs repair. And I, I think I got it for that one for 15 bucks or something like that. Um, in most cases, cause uh, you know, they're available down in the States and not up here in Canada. In most places I'm paying twice as much for shipping of the thing to Canada than I'm paying for the thing itself. So you have to add on to any of the prices I say, maybe about 30 or $40 for shipping. And that's what they ended up costing me. So I think if you're looking to add to your kit inexpensively, uh, you know, 50 to $75 spent on one of these, and that's including shipping, I think would be money well spent. And if you can find one locally and get it for 35 or $40, wow, that'd be fantastic. Anyway, thanks for joining me today, folks. I just thought I'd give you a quick look at a nice inexpensive way to expand your kit. We'll see you in the next video. Thank you.